Okay, hello everyone. My name is Tony. I work in Midokura, that is a Sony Group company. And in this session, I will talk about secure virtualization for microcontroller units using WebAssembly. So first of all, I will talk about the vision of the company. We want an accessible platform that powers uh, intelligent solutions for vision sensors. Our objective is to bring to the market easy to use sensing devices, lower the barrier for solution developers, promote an agile development even for uh, edge devices, lower the operational cost, that is, that you can manage and deploy new applications in an easy way, promote the polyglot development, that is, that you write the code for your embedded system in, la in the language that you want, and have a marketplace to connect AI developers that creates the models and train, train them for a specific uh, domain, and solution developers where they can uh, upload pieces of code so that it can be reused in a much more complex uh, scenario. The vertical applications that we are focusing right now are retail stores, smart factoring, um, smart cities, and smart home. Okay. I will introduce and explain a little bit the problems of development on tiny IoT devices. Development is not agile. That is, um, right now we are using real-time operating systems. Then, in some way, it acts like a library. The application is coupled with uh, the OS, and they have to be tested together, even though uh, you can separate, but in the end, uh, the way to test it is by, by using the, the operating system. The coupling of the OS and the application often uh, leads to a waterfall development, where uh, you are applying all the testing at the end of the development cycle. But embedded devices are typically designed for an, an, a specific task, so it's not a problem. If your focus is to only deploy an application, it can be uh, OK. But since our aim is that you can reuse your embedded device by deploying new applications or uh, applying a continuous de uh, deployment, this can have uh, some, yeah, some drawbacks. Not safety and isolation. Tiny IoT devices are based on MCUs. That's most of them, they don't have a memory management unit. Therefore, no uh, virtual memory. And if you want to apply continuous deployment, uh, there is a higher risk. And with the target that I have said before of having a, a marketplace and take code from, all, from other people, it can be too risky. Applications difficult to, to develop. Well, there is a high barrier for applications developers because the code is coupled to the OS, so you need to know Zephyr or Natex or FreeRTOS. And applications are typically written in C, which, well, it's not a problem for, for us, but for AI developers, it can be a, a high barrier. Limited code reuse because you are coupled with the OS, and there are our specific interfaces and drivers. And uh, as I have introduced before, there is a technological gap between the tools that the AI developers use and the ones that are uh, being used in the embedded systems. So we want to basically uh, break this, this barrier. How we are trying to solve that? By using WebAssembly. And here I will do a very brief introduction. What is WebAssembly? It is a low-level bytecode format that runs in a sandbox environment. It is compatible with multiple languages. Uh, here it says high-level languages, but uh, like right now it is basically C, C++, and Rust. But there are others, such as uh, assembly script, that it's a type of, of JavaScript. And also, um, currently, we are supporting Python. So in the next following slides, I will explain how we are doing that. The platforms are anything that you can imagine, like browsers, servers, and now uh, even tiny uh, IoT devices. But the only uh, constraint is that the interpreter is compatible in that platform. The size is very compact. It is uh, fast execution and high security by definition of uh, how WebAssembly it is specified. WebAssembly for sandboxing. How many protections or which protections uh, WebAssembly has? All what the language level uh, provides to you. For instance, if you are using Rust, you are going to get all the benefits of it. But also, there is a runtime level protection. That is because WebAssembly interpreters are forced uh, to check that the memory accesses are within the, the bounds 
of, uh, of your application because of the linear memory. There are other uh, types um, checks, um, well, o other uh, security checks. For instance, uh, the type safety at both at compiler and runtime. And there are other uh, protections, like for example, this control flow integrity uh, to prevent hijacking attacks. Okay. As I was mentioning at the beginning, we want uh, to run um, applications from multiple languages, to run them in multiple target architectures and multiple OSs. Basically, here in this diagram, we have that uh, we are supporting C, Rust, and Python, that we compile uh, this code into a WebAssembly module. And then we have the interpreter compatible with the OS and the target, um, and the target architecture. And then um, we have other layers. Why we need other layers? Because the WebAssembly it is able to run the application, but there are some cases where you want this sandbox environment to access the native site. For instance, if you want to do some neural network computation, you could compile the neural network um, inferencer in a WebAssembly, but if you want to take profit of an accelerator, you will need to go native. The way to access the native part, it's by using WebAssembly system interface. That is an standardization API and that provides a secure way to access the system resources. And for instance, um, WebAssembly system interface has some um, standardized layers for the file system, the network, and for TensorFlow or PyTorch, that in this case is WASINN, WASI Neural Network. There are several um, WASM interpreters. The one that we uh, chose, it is WebAssembly Micro Runtime that it's part of the Bytecode Alliance. This interpreter can run as an interpreter or just in time and ahead of time. The OSs and architectures that are supported are very uh, various, like x86, ARM, RISC, and operating systems, uh, even it's, it is supported for Cypher. And the ahead of time compilation provides a, a fast execution that for some computational um, uh, expensive applications, it is within 2x of native. WAMR also supports some uh, source level debugging that it's um, very beneficial for us because otherwise, um, yeah, testing the applications, it's, it's quite difficult. Okay. Now I, I will introduce some challenges for a pro polyglot environment. Okay, here I will start uh, presenting some survey from um, Stack Overflow. And as you can see, the languages that directly compiled into WebAssembly, that are C, C++, and Rust, are within a 25% of uh, popularity. But it is in interesting to see that Python and JavaScript are around um, a 50%, a 50% of, of people. So if we want to target all these people, we need a way to make sure that these languages can directly compile into WebAssembly because otherwise you are losing a very uh, extensive market. Which are the most popular frameworks? So here we can see NumPy, Pandas, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and, and PyTorch uh, within others. So it is clear that if we want to target AI for uh, vision sensing applications, we need to be able to, com um, to make sure that these frameworks are compatible with WebAssembly also. In our case, um, we have um, like create a, a POC, making sure that we could compile NumPy uh, for WebAssembly, and later on I will show an example. Okay. We want to empower flexibility and dynamic deployment, that is, we want to make sure that a complex solution can be broken down in smaller and manageable modules so that you can um, like reuse them and provide them in a marketplace. And multi-language platform that leverage the strengths and features of the different languages. As I said before, if you are using Rust, it will have the language level protection. But if you want to do some AI and you want to do some matrix multiplication or run a neural network, use Python for it, don't uh, make the matrix multiplication in C, which could be, but maybe it's not the best way to do it. So here I will introduce the motivation use case. We wanted to do a people counting application. 
And what we previously had was a people detection and a license plate recognition. Some components were shared, for instance, access the camera sensor, send data to the cloud, or run the neural network. So here we have an example of a license plate that was detected, and we were uh, streaming the annotated image with the bounding box. And then here in the other image, we have a things board um, yeah, screenshot where we can see that the license plate, the license plate was um, well recognized. Okay, this license plate, it is in Japanese, so it is normal if you don't recognize the, the characters. Okay. So what we wanted to do was, uh, in fact, people counting. We already um, and, um, had worked with Fermut, that it's a framework or a neural network um, that does the tracking, and we had several questions. Do we rewrite all the logic of um, that it's applied after the, uh, the inference? Do we rewrite it in C, C++, or Rust? And then how we ensure that the codes are equivalent? And the other option that we had is how we execute Python directly from, from the repository. So what we started to do was, okay, we tried to, uh, to run Python in WebAssembly. So we took uh, CPython, that is the C interpreter of, of Python, and we saw that it already contains some configuration and helpers to cross-compile Python into WebAssembly. And as you can see, here, the python.wasm, it is of type WebAssembly, and by using guywasm, that is the interpreter that Wammer provides, and putting some, some flags, basically, to, to um, specify where the Python path is and giving permissions to access the directories, we could run Python uh, in WebAssembly directly. So, but what we wanted to do was running the post-processing of, of, the, of the neural network. So what we did was transpiling the Python package of Fermut into C by using Cython. Then we called the Python module using the CPython API, uh, CPython C API, and then we uh, made sure that the modules are frozen because otherwise uh, you have to put the Python pass path because uh, the built-in modules are not embedded into the Python executable, but instead they are accessed uh, at random. So here we have a silly example where we have the Fibonacci. And what we did here it is to basically apply the translation and um, we called from the, the CPython uh, glue code um, this function with an input of 10. And as you can see here with the S trace, the only things that you need to access it is here, the frozen main dot wasm. The rest, it is uh, embedded into the WebAssembly. So there is no need for the WebAssembly to access anything outside of the WebAssembly. That this is what we wanted to do. Now I will introduce a little bit uh, how WebAssembly debugging works. As I said, we are using WebAssembly micro runtime and it straightforward, and uh, well, it uh, has available some BSA code extension that compiles, run, and debugs your code uh, quite easily. So for instance, you can install this uh, BS code extension, and voila, here we have a sample application that um, basically shows a little bit what can support, and it's all what you need, or at least the most, um, yeah, the most basic features, that is the variable view, the call stack, and putting breakpoints. So it is as easy as running this WebAssembly extension. Okay. Now I will introduce the, the wedge, that is the product that tries to integrate and facilitate all the topics that I have um, explained at the beginning. So wedge basically integrates the entire IoT device um, lifecycle uh, management, where we focus on the application creation, but also the device monitoring and the end-to-end -end management of yeah, providing the modules in the marketplace and making sure that the SDKs that you need um, are available and that can be deployed. So here what we have, it is on the left, the solution in developer that uses the SDK, and that then through the Wedge Cloud, that uses the IoT platform uh, to talk with, with the devices, 
and it is able to deploy the, the WebAssembly modules into the wedge agent. That is the, the piece of code that uh, integrates with WAMR uh, to execute the, the WebAssembly modules. So in this part, the solution developer, what it's doing is using what we call vision sensing application. That it's the combination of simple steps uh, to create a more complex uh, and meaningful task. Okay. As I said, we aim for composable and reusable uh, WASM modules. The developer is agnostic of in which device it will run. The only thing that um, it is um, like implicit, it is the interfaces that you need, that they are for um, like imported from WASI. And then uh, we aim to create from low code, no code. Okay. We um, want to promote having uh, using a UI so that basically you put uh, the nodes or the modules uh, in your application by using by using it instead of doing the coding. And in the second part, what we have is Wedge Cloud that provides an on-the-fly optimization for a variety of, of targets. That means that we are compiling ahead of time the modules knowing the target architecture. And then we are doing the deployment and lifecycle management we, where from the cloud you can see if the modules um, are running fine, and if not, the reason, because maybe um, yeah, the WebAssembly module, for instance, is trying to import a WASI layer that it's not implemented, so you will be able to check that. The device will still run fine, and you could deploy a new application fixing this, this error. The wedge uh, also provides a, an SDKs. For instance, the sensors, how to read an image, and how to configure uh, the sensor. Some AI uh, machine learning uh, that are the basic ones, how to load a model, how to run inference. And this part, it is not a wedge SDK per se, but it's by using WASCNN. That is something that is a standard. Then there are some communications uh, APIs, such as send telemetry to the cloud or do, or do some HTTP requests. And finally, some node-to-node -node me um, messaging passing and device-to-device. And here there is also some data storage for local database or blob storage. What we aim is that each of the APIs that we see that are required to have a meaningful task, we try to contribute to the community so that in the end everything you see something that it's a standard. Okay? As we are doing for the AI uh, ML with WASNN and, and in WAMR concretely. And what's the wedge agent? Well, the wedge agent is like a Kubernetes in IoT devices. It basically automates the lifecycle management of workloads and uh, yeah, loads the, the WebAssembly modules and makes sure that uh, they are working uh, as expected and it is reporting some status of them uh, into the cloud. And it leverages WebAssembly micro runtime, as I said before. The wedge agent device stack is basically this. You have the hardware, the OS, the native library and device drivers, where these native libraries are the WebAssembly system interface implementation for each of the devices. And then we have the wedge services APIs that are not the standard yet, and the WASI layers that are the ones that are standard. And finally, on top of that, we have the WebAssembly micro runtime that manages the end modules that you have uh, deployed into your device. So, conclusions. The state of the IoT devices, it feels, uh, it seems as, uh, as wha what is happening in the Android ecosystem. There are a huge variety of different devices, but in the end, the application that you are, um, what we want to aim is that the application that you want to run, it is um, the same in all of them. You don't have to download a different uh, WhatsApp. You go to uh, Google, uh, Google, uh, Google Store and you install it directly. You don't have to uh, specifically say, hey, I want WhatsApp for my Xiaomi or I want WhatsApp for my Google Pixel. So we want to, to, have, uh, to have that. And we are open sourcing the wedge agent. So in case that you have any question, you can contact us in info at midocura.com and we will be very, very happy to share information with you. Okay. 
And then here we have we have a demo that is for the people counting BSA. Okay, let me. One moment. Okay. So basically, this people counting BSA it's running on a, a Raspi with the Coral accelerator for the for doing the the inference. And the the, the the cam is a Raspi cam version two. As you can see here, we are using Thingsworld for doing the device uh, registration. Okay, where you basically have to put uh, the name of the device and put the certificates so that the device can um, yeah the the device can map into the IoT platform. Okay, so as you can see right now, uh, the device it is still not reporting any attributes. And after connecting it, we can see that there is no modules running there. This is what we aim for a UI that um, pro uh, provides the low code, no code, that in this case is using Node-RED, but we are improving this part because we see that Node-RED is limi limiting us. Okay. And basically what you need to do is know the device ID so that you can deploy for a particular device. Okay, and now what we are going to do is uh, create the application, basically. Where here on the left, you have some modules that can be reduced. Okay, in this case, the BSA is the people counting BSA. And the people counting BSA has uh, one input and, and one output. So the first node, it is the node extract, that it's basically the node that it's getting the frame from the sensor. As I have said, it is uh, common in all, the, in all the BSAs that we have been uh, developing. Then we have running the inference of the model. We are applying the Fermut post-processing to get the, the tracks. Then we're applying um, the tracking logic, the counting logic, and finally drawing in the image uh, the tracks. And the last note is send image so that we can see um, yeah, in the video stream uh, yeah, the, the application running. Here we are adding some other connections because if you want to synchronize the nodes, you have to um, to send this kind of, of information. Okay. Finally, when you have your application already created, you can go and take the BSA for from the marketplace, connect uh, that with the deployment, connect it with the device, and finally doing the deployment into the into the device that you have selected. As you can see here in the left, it is Coral running inference because otherwise the performance is quite quite bad. So as you can see, there is, this is running in the in the RASP, and this line basically um, it is for counting how many people is crossing from one area to the other. And the information that you see in the in the right is basically how many counts uh, they, there are there. So, as I have said, the only parts that are um, new from compared with the other uh, applications were running the code of the Fermut that was written in Python, and all the rest was shared um, with the other applications that we had, like getting the frame and running inference and sending the image to, uh, to the cloud. Okay. And that's it for the video. And that's it for the presentation. Thank you very much. Any question? Uh, back to the accelerator. Oh, sorry. <laughs> What's the uh, performance impact of the um, example you just showed compared to just using the uh, accelerator with its libraries directly? Okay, um, there are some options to uh, try to avoid doing some memory copies from native to WebAssembly and then sharing it with, with the native again. So for instance, the reference type, 
that what we what you could do is store the image always in native and only pass a, a reference, not a pointer, because you would be breaking the WebAssembly uh, idea of uh, giving information from the native, but just sharing an index so that it can be reused. In this case, we were doing the main copy because still the reference types um, are not as solid as we as we want. But yeah, like ideally, we shouldn't do uh, memory copies as you are as you are suggesting. The problem here is that WASCNN, that it's the API for running the inference, right now what it's doing is expecting the, that you're passing the data. So we should uh, reiterate with the community and see how we could fix that. Yes, uh, so I wanted to ask you about the software updates like those models, maybe you know some of them fairly large in size. So can you update separately if you want to update the model or part of the application? Um, how, how does it work today? Okay, it, it is not shown here, but the WebAssembly module contains the, right now in our case, the, the URL so that the model can be downloaded. What we are aiming for the next iteration is that you can configure the module and that you can have the code as it is, but put the URL um, there dynamically. And of course, um, this is a problem not just for WebAssembly, but in general for embedded systems. Usually what you do is you quantize the model and try to reduce the size as much as possible. But it's a problem in general, not just in this case. And for instance, to run it in the TPU, you have to quantize it and compile it for the STPU, and in this case, is Coral. So yeah, like we have the restrictions in <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> Thank you so much. In, in fact, sorry, the, mo the highest bottleneck here in this case to get three frames per second that we are exploring how we can improve that was the running the, inf the, the inference because we are um, yeah, tight with it. Any other question? Is there any question from the live presentation? No, yeah. not yet. I have a question regarding debugging. Um, can you, for example, debug uh, was code that was written in Rust or C++? Yeah, well, basically, as soon as you have the dwarf um, inside the WebAssembly, you, you can do the debugging. Uh, we have tested it for C, C++, uh, and I think that it, in Rust is also possible. But for instance, in Python, what I think that you could debug is the, the glue code, not the Python code. I mean, the glue code is the one that calls uh, through the C Python API the Python package that it's compiled. The Python package won't be easy to debug, but the glue code could be. Yeah. Uh, I had one question. So you mentioned about the project being open source. So is the project open source right now? The web chain is still not open source, and I think that the last final announcement will be in the KubeCon of North America. But okay. we are still um, yeah, deciding how we do that, but for sure our aim is to, to open source it. And uh, could you probably just describe the reason behind why you chose the specific WebAssembly runtime to be the one that you showcased instead of Wasm time or some other WebAssembly runtime? Like, what's the reason of choosing Quammer? Yeah. Well, because the wedge agent is written in C, so for us what's was more um, easy to, to integrate with. And also because it supported Natex, that was a platform that was uh, something that we really wanted to target. At, at that point of, of time. As I said, we are part of Sony Group Company, and um, it was important for some cameras uh, of SSS, of Sony. And have you explored Wasm Edge as well, as a potential runtime? Yeah, like our idea is that the wedge chain is not coupled with Whammer only, so that we c could uh, switch from one to the other. We, we haven't testing it, uh, tested it, but yeah, like hopefully we could integrate with multiple ones. Okay.
Yeah, I uh, don't need a, a long explanation, but how were the dependencies handled? For example, I don't know if some of the modules depended on OpenCV or some other libraries. Uh, like normally Python just links to a C version uh, of the library. Uh, how, how is it handled in, in WASM? Like, if you're writing a code in C that uses OpenCV, here you have two options, or you embed OpenCV in WASM, which you are basically uh, losing some performance. And if not, what you have to do is to put the OpenCV as a native library, expose the native library with a WASI layer, that in this case OpenCV won't be, uh, it is not, well, there is no WASI layer for image processing right now, so what you could do it is think of a WASI layer and try to contribute to the community so that it gets standardized. And finally, from your Python, uh, Python code, you import the headers of this WASI layer. In the case of Python, it's a little bit different. We don't have a, a WASI layer for NumPy, for instance. What we, do, what, get, what we did is compile um, and froze the NumPy module into the WebAssembly directly. Okay, so it's a, um, as I said, we aim to target multiple languages and each of them they have their particularities. Yeah. Is that clear now or? I have one more question. Uh, so you mentioned that this is also applied for camera. So I assume that you may have use cases where, uh, let's say, the AI model needs a full frame image of the camera. But since you're running a camera, you may have use cases where you need to do crop or additional adjustments, uh, scaling of the image for the camera purpose. So how you deal with that problem? Or do you address any of that problem where you actually need to have possibly a, a, a separate you know, type of frame for ML versus uh, an application using the camera as a camera on, on that device? Yeah, like. Um there is a module that it's called OpenCV here, it, and it's related with the with the previous question. And what we did is we implemented a layer that it's not a standardized. We put we placed OpenCV native, and we basically um, created uh, the signatures and the functions for uh, calling, for instance, the resize because it's not the same one network to the other. It depends on the input tensor shape. But yeah, like right now it's not a standard, so the modules that we were creating for that cannot run on other interpreters right now. If in the future this is standardized, it could uh, run in, yeah, in all the interpreters that implement the WASI layers. That's why we are trying to promote that all the steps that we see that we need from native are, are standardized. Not just because we um, get profit of it, but also the community in general. Yeah. And as I said, like the previous question, like why we are using WASM time, uh, sorry, WAMR, it is somehow related with it. Um, it is like if we want to switch from an interpreter to another, we have to really push hard to make all these uh, layers standardized. Otherwise, we, we will be quite coupled to Wammer. Thank you. Any other question? No more questions? Any question from the uh, online view? No? no. Then, yeah. Thank you all. And if any question, we can.